Hello, everyone. Um, this talk will be, in a way, uh, uh, very similar to Maurice's talk just now, but then much more concrete, rather than talking about uh, Romanian manifolds and nice smooth things with nice bundles. We just think about everything discrete, uh, everything um, we're going to discretize the manifolds on meshes, and then show how we get something like a graph CNN uh, as an instantiation of a coordinate-free uh, convolutional neural network. And we call that the uh, gates equivariant CNN. So um, in CNN on meshes, what we kind of the design goal of this project is to uh, build a network uh, that operates on the mesh like a graph neural network, but has the same expressivity and same kind of equivalent analytic solutions as an um, CNN that would operate on the on the plane. Um, so a mesh is a representation of a, of a curved manifold in a, in a certain discrete way. And uh, an example to think of is uh, a human artery. Um, and in the end, I'll talk a bit about an application where we uh, study, uh, where we try to model how blood flows through arteries using um, um, uh, this method. Um, and um, yeah, in particular, uh, we're interested there in outcomes of the simulation. So we're interested in if blood flows through the artery, what kind of shear stress does the blood flow exert on the wall? Because that can have uh, medically important uh, consequences. Um, the key problem with defining a CNN on, um, on a mesh and how, why it's more difficult on the plane is, as we've heard now uh, from Maurice, is um, gauges. Um, whereas on a, on a plane, we can canonically orient uh, our convolutional kernels on a mesh, there's no, as you can see, there's no clear notion of up or down, so no clear notion of how to orient the kernel, and kind of the whole project is uh, figuring out a way around that. And the solution is, of course, gauge equivariance. This is a uh, collaboration with Maurice, of whom you've met, uh, Taku Cohen and uh, Max Wedding. Um, in a rough outline of, uh, of this talk, which I don't think we'll last an hour and a half, but we'll see. Um, I'll give a brief kind of uh, story about CNNs um, on planes, um, then tell you how we would pass messages on meshes, um, and then how we would make such message passing uh, correspond to a gauge equivariant convolution if our feature fields are scalar fields. Think of a temperature field that just assigns a real number to each point on the mesh. Uh, we'll show that this is deficient in that it doesn't really achieve our goal of looking like a normal CNN and how, how we why we must use uh, vector fields like tangent factors uh, to overcome these uh, limitations. Um, and this brings us to our uh, uh, um, uh, to a general uh, framing of uh, gates equivariant mesh convolutions. Uh, then I'll touch on a couple of implementation details, like how do we implement um, such a constrained kernel that's like a linear map that lives in the subspace of all possible maps. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about how to compute the geometric quantities that we need, so the exponential map and parallel transport. I'll touch on a couple of different ways and um, mention their pros and cons, and then I'll say a bit about how uh, collaborators applied uh, this method on, on, on a uh, medically relevant uh, topic. So uh, a normal CNN that you've now seen a lot is um, uh, we'd have a feature field, so that would just assign a real number to each pixel on the plane. And we have a kernel, for example, a 3x3 three three kernel that just has three real numbers. And to, to get the output, we would apply uh, in patches this kernel, um, do a matrix multiplication, do a, a contractive vector uh, with the, the patch, uh, get an output, and uh, that's the output of the convolutional kernel. So we can see that as such, uh, we, uh, for point P, the output, we look at the neighbors, called Q. Um, we um, look at the um, relative position of um, the neighbors, um, and um, um, this is not the best way of writing it down, um, and, uh, and apply the, the feature. So this is the CNN that you've seen before. And we alternate these with nonlinearities uh, to build uh, bigger neural networks. And then the goal is to learn the kernels K, such that uh, the network does something that we care about. Uh, a, an important distinction in, in CNNs, uh, and where we'll see where uh, we need to do some, some math to uh, be as expressive on the mesh as we are on the plane, is in reg with regard to isotropy. An anisotropic kernel, a 3x3 kernel, uh, 
uh, would uh, look like this. So um, it would have where every color denotes an independent parameter. So uh, it would have nine parameters. Whereas an isotropic kernel would look the same in all directions and uh, would only have three parameters. And um, as you can maybe imagine that um, we can learn an anisotropic kernel that has a that makes in one linear transformation can see the difference between vertical lines by uh, having some vertical pattern in the kernel or horizontal lines by some horizontal pattern. Whereas it's in it's not possible to express in a single linear transformation such a vertical or horizontal edge detection in an isotropic kernel because it doesn't have a notion of left and right. And uh, as we'll see, um, a naive implementation uh, or naive equivariant way with scalar fields uh, of building a CNN on the mesh uh, will lead to an isotropic kernel, and this has limited expressivity. But by going to uh, gauge equivariant kernels, uh, we can also build um, direction awareness or anisotropy uh, in our network. So a mesh um, is, uh, as I said, a discretization of a curved surface. And uh, concretely, we'll here look at uh, uh, triangular meshes where all the faces are triangles, but more generally, you can think of uh, uh, arbitrary polygons, so you get something like this. Um, but in this particular uh, paper, we are thinking of meshes as some discretization of a manifold, not just any collection of faces and edges. So we need some constraints on our mesh, uh, such that um, the mesh actually reflects uh, a manifold. And uh, these constraints are the following. Um, the, um, yeah, the first is that every edge needs to touch two faces so that it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it, so that it corresponds with a, a surface. Um, do I have a laser pointer here? Yes, I do. So that uh, here you would have a, uh, an edge that is connected to three faces and uh, that, uh, that's not allowed, that doesn't constitute the manifold mesh. Uh, you can also think of manifold a surface. Um, do I have a laser pointer here? Yes, I do. So that uh, here you would have a, uh, an edge that is connected to three faces, and uh, that uh, that's not allowed, that doesn't constitute the manifold mesh. Uh, you can also think of manifolds with boundary, and then an edge uh, touches only one face. Um, and each vertex must be like fully surrounded by um, by edges. So, for example, the vertex here is fully surrounded by uh, faces, so it kind of forms a star. Um, and that's a. Can you see my mouse? No. Um, um, so that uh, so we require that of all the vertices. Furthermore, we're looking at oriented manifolds, uh, so we disallow the Möbius strip that Maurice likes um, for uh, for practical reasons, and this is. Uh, this leads to something representing like a volume, like the boundary of a volume. This is sometimes called a watertight mesh. And um, an oriented manifold here means that we have faces, and these faces are represented in an ordering. So, for example, we can th think of this face um, having an ordering one, two, three, and this is very related to um, uh, what Chris talked about in the synthesis, um, that the ordering of these numbers uh, gives us an orientation on the face. Um, and this orientation on the face by some right hand rule gives us a normal direction. And what we require is that all these normal directions are canonically are similarly oriented so that we have a, so that the two faces have a shared notion of what is the outside and the inside of a mesh. So um, this um, rabbit is an uh, oriented manifold because we can uh, choose uh, one of the directions to be the outside of the um, of the rabbit. Um, and uh, we'll work in this regime because um, 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 yeah, and that's the regime we're working. Any questions so far? Yeah. It, it doesn't really matter so much. Um, in the, I, uh, no, in, in the thing we end up with, it doesn't matter really. In the end, we'll forget about most of the mesh anyway. <laughs> um, any other questions? So a uh, mesh is passing on the mesh, so we can just see a mesh as a graph. Um, so uh, a, a mesh uh, induces a graph by looking at the adjacency matrices. So we can do a message passing directly on the graph. So uh, this would just be the message passing along edges. 
Um, but we can also uh, think of um, message passing over larger hot neighborhoods. So we could, in theory, also do message passing uh, from uh, between nodes that are not directly neighbors. And uh, also that is because in our final implementation, we'll forget about uh, most of the uh, X structure after all. Um, so uh, then the message passing is, as we've seen now many times, um, we have a, uh, an input feed. We, have, we want the output at a point P. Uh, we have an input feature at um, uh, point Q, and we have some message passing kernel. And here, in general, we'll allow for these message passing kernels to be uh, different for different edges. Um, so this is some matrix uh, for each edge, and then we uh, do some aggregation operation uh, to uh, give us the output feature at a point P. Um, so if we relate how a convolution on an image and a mesh looks like, uh, we, we, as, as we discussed uh, in, uh, in the plane, uh, we can, for each point, um, look at each neighbor and give this a canonical coordinate. So we can say if we have a 3 by 3 kernel, well, this is my neighbor that is on my top left of me. And so we can express that as like a, a canonical uh, uh, XY coordinate for each neighbor. If you now think of a mesh, there's no really such thing because we don't have a, a canonical way of orienting this mesh. So what do we what do we do as a first step to uh, to relate these two? Um, well, we look at the tangent plane. So we look uh, if we are interested in a point P, uh, then we can uh, define a, pl a plane at a point P um, in various ways um, and um, define a, an exp an exp uh, a logarithmic map that maps all the neighbors uh, of a point P to a point on the plane. And uh, later I'll say. Uh, about a couple of different ways on how we can compute these quantities. Uh, and we can say this for direct neighbors, but also for indirect neighbors. Um, in our setup, we'll uh, look at polar coordinate, uh, um, uh, coordinates, polar coordinates on the tangent plane. So we talk about a radius between the points and an angle uh, between the points. But a key, a key issue here, and, th and this is what the whole uh, gate story um, boils down to is that we have no canonical way of choosing uh, the theta is zero direction on our polar coordinates. So the choice of gates in this uh, sense corresponds to choosing uh, one direction in our tangent plane that we say is the, the theta is zero direction. And uh, as you can imagine, we could have also chosen uh, another angle, another direction as the theta is zero direction. And uh, this constitutes to uh, two different gauges and they're related by gauge transformations. Any questions? The, the logarithm is the Riemannian logarithm, the inverse of the Riemannian exponential function. Yeah, yeah, the, the discrete uh, equivalent uh, thereof. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we, so as I said, we were working on this oriented manifold mesh. Um, in this in this uh, setting, all our faces have a, a well-defined uh, normal. So this is uh, an uh, an uh, a vector pointing out of each face. So what we can do is uh, to define a normal for point P is we just take the average of the phase normals of all adjacent phases, or if you want, we can weigh the f we can weigh that by the size of the phases to get something slightly more stable. Um, and this gives us a normal direction, and then we can define the tangent plane to just be the tangent plane normal to the normal vector at P. Um, we say that this is uh, a Riemannian because we get a um, metric structure on this tangent plane. And this metric structure is just the one that we derive from the ambient space. Because this tangent plane is a subspace of R3. And thus, we can just uh, measure things uh, on the plane by thinking them as living in the ambient space and then measuring them in the normal way in the uh, Euclidean ambient space. Um, a gauge? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of ways. Uh, Acquisitions. I don't know. I, I can include it. It would be several. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think there are different ways of doing it. Yes. But uh, yeah. So what what we're doing in implementation is just to say if we have three faces, that doesn't work. 
and we have three vectors. Sorry for going through. Then we just take the average vector, which would be something like this, and then we take the plane normal to that. Um, and the gates here for a particular frame choice for point P is just uh, a map from this abstract vector space uh, to concrete coordinates where we would take polar coordinates. Um, normally, in manifolds like spheres, you wouldn't have uh, like a global choices of gauge. Uh, but here we don't care about continuity. Uh, we just choose any arbitrary, maybe random gauge uh, at each point, and we're going to work on that. And as our method is gauge equivariant, it doesn't really matter uh, which gates, gates we've uh, chosen. So because we're in the discrete domain, there's no worries about uh, continuity. And um, as I said, because the gauges are just defined by choosing one direction in the tangent plane to represent the theta zero direction, um, each of those is uh, related by a rotation of this zero direction. Uh, so the uh, gauge group that we care about, the, the G structure, as Maurice mentioned, is here the group of planar rotations uh, because the, all gauges are related by just rotating uh, the, the uh, frame. Um, and uh, in polar coordinates, uh, that's the reason why we work in polar coordinates. Uh, that is um, the um, a gauge, uh, if we have one gate, one vector expressed in a gauge W, then if we have any other gauge W prime, uh, this vector has the same radius uh, and its uh, angle is shifted uh, by an additive constant, uh, modulo 2 pi. Where, uh, so the, yeah. Um, so now how do we build a CNN? There's, uh, we have this uh, arbitrariness in the choice of gauge, and we, we can also think of the gauge as being defined by picking one neighbor for each node that represents the theta zero direction. And um, what are our options? Well, our first option is to define all uh, and these are already mentioned by Maurice. I'm just going to do it again. Um, these are, um, are we going to do all our convolutions to be invariant to the choice of gauge? So every layer by itself doesn't care about the choice of gauge. Um, but um, this would be um, isotropic. It wouldn't be aware of any uh, direction. And uh, that is the limited expressivity that we try to avoid. Another option that we could do is try to find some algorithm and um, um, and Michael mentioned in his talk that it it is actually uh, possible for a lot of meshes uh, to do find like a canonical choice of orientation uh, on points that is like uh, uh, useful and stable. Um, uh, but it may be ill-defined. For example, if you work on a sphere, a perfect sphere, uh, then there's no uh, canonical way of doing this. And the nice way, of course, is to be gauge like variant. Um, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to have all our features um, uh, be defined such that we know how they would transform as had our gates been different. So we have some gates and we know what the features are in some coordinates. And uh, had we uh, chosen another gates, uh, then we know by what rule uh, these coordinates would change. And then we require an um, equivariance constraint um, that if um, we um, apply a gate transformation and then the network that that is the same as the network and then the gates transformation. Uh, Maurice made a, a distinction between uh, the diagram. So here what we are assuming in a way is that our kernel is gates invariant to relate it back to Maurice's talk. Um, um, so that um, our kernel would work on any gate similarly. Um, so um, one early work uh, that discusses uh, how to do uh, convolutions on meshes uh, um, is the geodesic CNN by um, uh, Muskie and collaborators. And uh, what they do is they fix any gates um, and uh, they define an unconstrained kernel, so uh, from the tangent space uh, to some real number um, with no, no constraints. And then they compute a convolution where um, the output at a point P is um, you look at the neighbors, uh, you look at um, the um, uh, relative coordinates of the neighbors, apply the kernel to a to the feature at the neighbor. Um, but now we add to the angle um, rotation G, and then we maximize this over G. Um, so it's quite easy to see 
that if we would have chosen another gate where this theta is shifted by some uh, uh, quantity, that this whole thing with the maximum is invariant uh, to such different choices. Um, so this is an example, but this uh, here, a single layer uh, would be isotropic because it wouldn't be able to uh, disambiguate uh, directions because it is uh, invariant to rotations. Um, so now let's uh, uh, try to uh, look in a bit more detail what a gauge equivariant um, network look like if all the features are scalar features. Uh, so scalar features, as I said, that's just um, a point. So we, we in, in this work here, we always put features on vertices, but you could just as well do something else by putting it on edges or faces. But let's stick with vertices now. So a feature then just assigns to each vertex a real number. And um, the transformation rule that we pick, if we pick different gauges, is that nothing happens at all. So the features are invariant to gauge transformations. Um, so uh, as I said, if we uh, are at a point P and we look at a point Q, then in one gauge, um, the um, uh, coordinates of Q in the frame at P um, would be polar coordinates. And in another frame, they would uh, the relative coordinates would be shifted by some group element uh, G, which is the gauge transformation between the two groups, between the two frames. So now we define a kernel to be um, um, an yet unconstrained um, um, a map from the tangent plane to the real numbers. And then we compute the uh, convolution in uh, gauge W. So uh, yeah, it's uh, we uh, simply do, um, uh, we um, sum over the neighbors and we apply the kernel. And because it's uh, a real number, um, it, we don't need to care about parallel tra transport just yet. Uh, we can just see this as uh, 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 multiplying two real numbers. Uh, but if we would do this in another gauge, we would get the kernel to be evaluated uh, at a, a different angle. And we want the output to uh, satisfy our transformation rule on the gauge change, and the transformation rule we chose is invariance. So what we will want is that these two uh, that these two outcomes uh, are equal, and uh, then you can simply see that uh, if that's true for any features, then the kernels must be the same for any direction, or the kernel again is isotropic, which is um, so gauge equivariance with scalar features implies that our kernels are isotropic, which is what we wanted to avoid. To tell the same uh, story in pictures, um, if we have a point P and some neighbors uh, Q. Then uh, we pick uh, one of the gauges we can pick is to set the A neighbor in the theta zero direction so that it gives us some frame. Then we do a convolution which aggregates these features into a feature at P. We could have also chosen the green neighbor as the um, reference neighbor. Um, so that would give us uh, a different local coordinatization. And we can see that these are related by gauge transformation by just rotating the whole picture. If we then would apply our convolution in the um, uh, frame in the gates at uh, B, we also get a value, and our gates equivariance constraint required that these two uh, outputs outcomes are the same. Um, because if we were to um, sort of reinterpret this output as a feature on the mesh, it would just be a scalar feature at a point P, and this is invariant under a change of gauge. So we can think of this as kind of a geometric convolution. This is exactly the same shape as the diagram that uh, Marie showed. Um, as a geometric convolution from a geometric frame-free, coordinate-free feature in the input to a coordinate-free feature at the output, that doesn't, um, and this constraint requires us that we do not care about uh, the orientation of these neighbors. So we get an isotropic um, convolution on the, um, we get an isotropic convolution if you want to be gauge equivariant between scalar features. Are there any questions about the scalar uh, case before we go to vectors? Um, that's a great question. I mean, um, this is here I'm talking about the linear regime mostly and with uh, max pooling. So if you were to do, if you would replace the max pooling with a uh, sum pooling, then you would get exactly this. 
Yeah, but maximum you're probably more expressive. Yeah, I don't have more insight than this. Yeah, I would be also interested in that. Yeah. And we have this benchmark for the stock project yesterday. Just from this test case, and then we compare these two options. Indeed, if you map all these things together, that works not very well. What what works not very well? Any further questions? Okay, so uh, now we see that we saw that scalar features lead to isotropy, and we don't want that. Um, so we look at more general features, um, and we look at vector features. So um, a vector feature is uh, defined by choosing uh, in some dimension d, um, means that every uh, um, vertex of the mesh has associated to it like a feature space of d dimensions. And uh, we also choose um, a rule of how this feature uh, space must transform if we move from one gate to another. Uh, and this uh, transformation rule is then, if we are looking at the linear transformations, is given by some matrix, a uh, row G, um, that assigns to each uh, rotation a, uh, a matrix. And um, a, a uh, an obvious requirement that we put on this is that um, um, if we transform by two gauges, um, that um, the uh, that uh, if we have two gauge transformations that we compose, uh, then that we get the same uh, linear transformations if we uh, compose the if we apply the gauge transformations both at the same time, or if we apply first the, the first and then the other. Uh, so uh, we can see this as a, a group homomorphism requirement. And uh, together, uh, this means that a vector feature is just a group representation uh, that maps from um, um, that that is homomorphism from uh, the um, group G of rotations to um, uh, the group of invertible linear transformations on uh, this vector space. Uh, and you've seen these already many times uh, this week. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, examples of such rows are to always pick just the number one uh, for all matrices and this would uh, constitute a scalar feature that doesn't change if we change gauge and uh, you could think of that as a pressure or effect or a pressure or temperature field on your mesh uh, another typical choice is to think of the tangent vectors um, as uh, vector features uh, so this uh, would uh, constitute a, a vector um, on the mesh that is tangential to the mesh itself at each point and uh, it would transform under the normal rotation matrices if we uh, rotate them by an SO2 transformation and in general um, we uh, can uh, categorize for this group SO2 all uh, representations as um, a concatenation of features that transform independently or as a, a rotation matrix uh, where we have an, uh, an integer n um, 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 where we uh, replace the specific uh, rotation matrix uh, with a rotation matrix where you have an integer n uh, before the group transformation. And uh, uh, you can show that any kind of vector feature can be uh, represented as just a concatenation of these uh, building blocks that are called irreducible representations. Um, so all we have to do is analyze the case for these irreducible representations and that gives us uh, uh, an, a method for looking at an arbitrary effective feature. Um, an important um, uh, uh, um, complexity that we have to deal with uh, if we think of arbitrary vector features is that if we have two vectors at two different points, that they don't form a linear space together. We can't just 
I take a linear combination of this blue vector at P and this red vector at Q. If we want to do any linear algebra that relates them, we need to first bring them to the same place. And this is called parallel transport. Um, in this uh, work, we look at uh, parallel transport along shortest paths, which you could take any paths. And um, um, a parallel transport is a, is a way of bringing this vector Q to the tangent plane at P so that we can do uh, linear algebra to relate them together. Um, in our, um, to analyze all possible parallel transport, uh, what we just need to do is we look at the uh, theta is zero direction in uh, both frames and parallel pro transport them uh, to each other and measure the angle. And uh, this is the um, parallel transport angle. And uh, by linearity, um, any parallel transport can be computed by just rotating the matrix uh, with this angle. So um, now we can study what a gauge equivariant convolution looks like if we uh, work with arbitrary vector fields. And um, to do that, we first need to define uh, an input and an output of our um, of our layer. So we have an input that is a, a d-dimensional representation rho, and the output will be a d-prime dimensional representation rho prime. And then we pick a, a kernel, yet unconstrained, um, from d-dimensions to d-prime dimensions, and then we derive constraints on this through gauge equivariants. Our convolution now includes an additional term. So um, we, again, uh, aggregate over neighbors. We have the kernel um, evaluated at the relative coordinates of a point of the neighbor Q. And here we have the uh, feature of the, uh, uh, um, the feature at the neighbor Q. And here we have this parallel transport angle that tells us how the uh, feature Q at its particular uh, at the chosen gauge um, needs to be rotated to be parallel transported to uh, the tangent plane at P. So this is just uh, a matrix, a matrix and a vector that we can co uh, contract via linear algebra. Um, now you can uh, show by a similar argument as, as I did before, that gauge equivariant gives us a constraint on the kernel, meaning that if we um, uh, look at the matrix K evaluated at a, at a point, um, that we get an equality if we um, rotate the input by a gauge transformation G, then evaluate the kernel at uh, the rotated coordinates. So that this should be the same as applying the kernel on the original coordinates and then rotating the output by representation by, uh, by G, where here we take the input representation. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's nice. Um, where uh, here we have the uh, input representation, here we have the output representation. No, it doesn't work. Um, hmm, they broke things. Okay, so uh, let's do the same again in, uh, in pictures. So uh, we start out with uh, a scalar features, uh, we have a point P and neighbors Q, and we have a scalar feature associated uh, with these neighbors, and we can express them in different gauges, and they look uh, like each other, but just rotated versions thereof. But now we have a convolutional kernel that outputs a tangent vector. Well, what that looks like, well, it, it, it takes as input uh, these uh, scalar neighbors and it outputs a vector at a point P. And um, we can think of this also uh, back uh, coordinate free as a vector on the mesh that is tangential to the tangent plane at point P. Now, if you would look at this, if you want this to be gauge equivariant, what we would want is that the output of the convolution in um, the other gauge um, is the same as the first one, but then rotated by the gauge transformation. So this gives us a constraint on the convolution. Um, so we can think of this as a coordinate free convolution from these features, from these scalar features on the mesh to uh, tangent vectors on the mesh, and uh, there is this um, uh, satisfying this constraint. But as we can see, um, these two inputs are related by a rotation, and the outputs are not the same. So th this shows that we are 
isotropic, that we are anisotropic or direction aware. Because when the input is, uh, uh, has a different direction, the output changes, uh, showing that we are um, sensitive to directions. Um, so we have this constraint uh, that uh, Amaris calls uh, G-steerability, and um, luckily this has solutions. So uh, we can first um, think of factorize this, so we can we see that the, the constraint doesn't really depend on the radius, so we can think of them as constituting of two independent parts, one in the radial uh, domain and one in the uh, angular domain, and the radial domain is my constraint. So now let's look at the angle, at the uh, direction. At the, at the angular part, k of theta. So um, if we think of the example where we map between tangent factors, uh, these are two-dimensional. Um, so uh, what we um, so a linear map uh, from two dimensions to two dimensions is a matrix, a four by four matrix, and we can represent a four by four matrix uh, here as um, in two with two arrows, where um, the red arrow says how we to what we map the one basis factor and the green arrow to say uh, what we map the um, other basis factor to. And I drew this in a circle because here I show the theta dependence uh, of this uh, function k. So we to, so the function k, we look at a certain uh, direction and then we see these two uh, arrows and that represents what the matrix looks like. So these are the four solutions. Uh, the one solution is a constant in theta and is the identity matrix everywhere. Um, the other solution is uh, also um, um, constant in theta, uh, but uh, represents a flipping. Um, and then there are two solutions that are um, um, not, that are that depend on theta. And uh, a, a, a key observation you could make, which um, you can um, uh, think of it in the terms of the representation theory of SO2, if you like, is that um, these matrices make um, two full rotations. So you see that on the top and the bottom, uh, we have the same matrix. Um, so we kind of, the kernel to map from between two vector features rotates kind of twice as fast. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, uh, pre we pre-compute these solutions and we linearly combine the independent solutions um, with learnable parameters, which I'll say a little bit more in a bit. Um, so in equations, we have um, all uh, different representations that we can uh, characterize as such. Yes. It's a good point. I mean, like factorizability of equations is kind of a very general concept. I don't know if there's a deeper connection than that. Maybe Maurice. Uh... Yes. Um, so what you're seeing there is a map from uh, the order one here, the order one here, and um, yeah, as I said in my talk, uh, if you want to solve this relative set, uh, you have to let one composition of the tensor product of these uh, errors, and uh, these are drawn coefficients uh, for SO2 and uh, here it borders uh, N and M, uh, they get uh, that they compose with N minus M and N plus M. And uh, for one and one, you have this one minus one, which is zero. This was the uh, first picture, and one plus one is two, which is why it's rotated yeah. twice. But uh, as I said, for, for SO3, uh, you would also get uh, yeah, according to mm -hmm. compositions and this set, and then like if you go from model J to order L. We have everything from J minus L up to J plus L as um, yeah, so so uh, as uh, uh, so so yeah, general solution. If we go from order n to an order m, they look like this. Where um, um, so from zero to zero, we get the one as we saw before. Um, from n to zero, we get something with uh, a cosine and a sine uh, of n. But if we go from m to m, we get four different solutions that we saw before where the minus says that we take the difference of the order. So if you go from one to one, we take the difference is zero. So these two are constant in theta, and these go by frequency two uh, loop around theta. But we also need to take special care for the uh, self-interaction, uh, because uh, the self-interaction in a way does not um, 
um, the, the, the kernel of the self-interaction does not depend on um, the uh, radius. Uh, so um, uh, in a way, it's the, stable, it's the only stabilizer of SO2. So the uh, symmetries is different, are, are different. So for the kernel, we get two solutions uh, if we map from N to N. And that's the identity and, uh, and the sign flip. Yes, I feel also need to make this decision. Yeah, uh, what I was talking about before showing is that this is our area of endomorphism. Yeah. And these matrices actually uh, give you uh, this multiplicity of two for each frequency, right? If you have this uh, n minus n and uh, n plus n, but uh, each frequency occurring twice and they correspond to these uh, two endomorphism matrices. So much that you have your translate. Thank you. Um, yes, and then we, um, so we have, um, yeah, solutions, and then we uh, linearly combine them um, with learnable parameters. Um, any questions on this part? Cool. All right, so in um, what we do if you want to build these things, uh, so for each layer, we pick an input and an output representation, and we have a pre-computation phase where we define tangent planes for each point, um, we pick a random gauge uh, at each tangent plane, it doesn't matter what we do. Um, we compute parallel transport between uh, points. Um, and um, then for each pair of points, uh, we uh, solve these uh, uh, kernel constraints evaluated at the relative coordinates uh, for each neighbor. Um, and then we um, have a big contraction where here we look at the uh, solutions of the equation, and the alphas here are the um, um, learnable parameters. Um, and we can just implement this as a big Einstein operation, and then it's uh, relatively fast. So the pre-computation may be slow, but in the end, it's just one Einstein operation to compute our transformation. Um, and if you do this, you get some nice symmetry properties. So it's by design uh, equivariant to the choice of gauge. So it doesn't matter which uh, frame we pick at each point. Um, we are completely intrinsic, at least if you pick your input features appropriately. So our whole method is completely ignorant about how our uh, mesh is embedded in R3. And that can be very desirable because sometimes it's impossible to canonically orient your mesh. Uh, maybe in the R3, you don't know what is the up and the down side of the R3. Uh, so uh, our method doesn't care about that and thus is invariant to this embedding. Um, and also, as Maurice mentioned, if our mesh ha has some isometries, um, then uh, if we do an active transformation of uh, the features uh, on the mesh uh, that um, uh, maps the mesh to itself, then uh, this um, method is also uh, equivalent to such transformations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's an excellent point. Um, and um, um, yeah, one should. I, I, I unfortunately have, haven't studied like deformation stability of this method. Um, I would guess that it is relatively stable if you kind of pick low level kernel, low frequency kernels uh, that don't vary uh, much if you change relative, the uh, relative coordinates. Um, and, and your method of uh, computing the logarithmic map and the parallel transport are stable, then my guess would be that you're quite deformation stable, but I don't have a strong argument on that. Um, and uh, the nice thing that is that if we apply our um, uh, method on a pixel grid, then we would get exactly um, a equivariant CNN on the pixel grid. Um, so um, that if you uh, would, you could see this as a, um, um, a CNN that, yeah, that, yes. So uh, up to a rotation, exact rotations of the pixel grid, which aren't actually continuous rotations, but uh, 90 degree angle rotations, uh, our method ex exactly coincides with a, uh, um, CNN method on the pixel grid, as Maurice introduced earlier. 
Um, and in, our, in my next talk, I'll say something about how you can get the same behavior, but then on graphs uh, under some assumptions uh, that are not embedded in a 3D space, so a completely graph-based version of, the, of this argument. Um, so now let's talk about how do we compute these logarithmic maps and this parallel transport that we feed as an input uh, to our method. Uh, we, I, I, we, well, we first tried this edge walking, that's how I call it, maybe there's a nicer name about it, uh, where we kind of traverse the mesh from face to face, from edge to edge, um, do something at each transition so that we um, uh, compute, can compute exponential maps and parallel transport. Um, another way is uh, related to diffusion of vectors and scalar fields on meshes uh, by the vector heat map, um, vector heat method, which I'll tell about later. And um, what we ended up using in implementation is a spherical approximation, um, where all we care about are how the tangent planes are oriented, and not what the underlying structure is of the of the mesh, or what the relative coordinates in ambient space are of the mesh. Um, but for the parallel transport. For the parallel transport, all we care about is um, the normal direction. Uh, excuse me. We are aware of the uh, uh, points. We are aware of the coordinates, the ambient coordinates in 3D space um, and the normal direction, but not how the mesh is structured in between. So the edge walking method that we originally tried, um, I just sketched some things here. I'm not going to go into detail, but it would. Uh, it would be that if we uh, do parallel transport or logarithm or an exponential map from a point P to a point Q, then that we do some sort of a linear algebra operation at each transition. So we figure out uh, an edge path between uh, two points. And then uh, at each uh, transition of edge to edge, we would do some linear operation that would correspond to parallel transport along these edges. You could also include this over faces, um, but it is, um, not very stable, it's expensive to compute, and mostly it's very difficult to implement correctly. We spend a lot of time trying that. Well, he's actually did. Um, so uh, another way um, that you can approach this uh, is um, via uh, diffusion of vector fields. So um, there's a, a, an elegant way uh, through the connection Laplacian to uh, have a notion of you put a vector at some point uh, in on the mesh and you diffuse this vector over the whole mesh. Um, so that's a, a well-defined uh, 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 method. And uh, this allows us, which is the insight in the paper vector heat method, to do parallel transport. So what do you do? You look at the point P and then you put a vector field uh, on the point P that points in the uh, X direction that defines your uh, gates at the point P and it's zero elsewhere. And then you just diffuse this vector field and this gives you so that's that's kind of what you can see here. So you uh, we started out with this vector, and then we diffused, and then we get a vector everywhere on the uh, on the mesh. And uh, this vector uh, is exactly the parallel transport, or corresponds to is an approximation of the parallel transport uh, from the point P to every point on the manifold. And if you take the limit of your diffusion time to zero, this will be correct according to this paper. Um, Similarly, you can compute the uh, logarithmic map. Um, so uh, the uh, polar coordinates uh, of a logarithmic map, uh, start, if we uh, start out at a point P, uh, then we can define like a radial field by uh, defining from a point P vectors outwards. So that's our initial vector field. Then you diffuse that vector field. And then there's a relationship between the distance of the points and the length of this vector field. Um, the angle uh, of the polar coordinates can similarly be computed. So here you start out with two vector fields. One vector field is radial, called R, and one vector field um, starts out just with a single vector. Then you diffuse both over the field and you measure the relative, this, the, the relative angle between them. And that coincides with the uh, parallel transport angle, sorry, the logarithmic map angle. Uh, if, uh, I'm just sketching here if you are interested in more details, then I really recommend you read the paper because it's a, a very elegant method. Um, and th they provide a discrete implementation through this, uh, through sparse linear algebra. And um, the complexity, they claim, approaches um, uh, linear time per node. And this is um, tricky because then 
for a whole mesh, this will be quadratic in a number of uh, points. And we find that for the meshes that we care about, um, um, that this actually becomes uh, large. Uh, you could maybe think of an alternative implementation where you only look at local neighborhoods, um, but uh, we couldn't find such implementation, uh, so that was difficult for us to do. Uh, this would be some like diffusion over some. Uh, so I, I I don't really know the implementation details, but th there's not an analytic form. There's like they rephrase this as an like a linear algebra problem, and then they use a solver to find it, which corresponds to the solution. And I think the solution they find is parallel transport along geodesics. So, uh, but we do something um, even faster. And and Aguirre, so what we think of our points uh, P and Q um, as just tangent planes, and then we only care about the points and their uh, normal directions, and not about the rest of the mesh. So we are in a like a spherical approximation. Um, so how that works? So um, given these two points, but you look at their normal vector. Uh, and then you take the cross product of the normal vector, which is the angle that you need to rotate along to map one normal vector to the other. Um, the uh, amount you need to rotate is uh, related, uh, is given by the inner product uh, of the two normal vectors. And then uh, we can say that the uh, logarithmic map, and this is our approximation, we say that the logarithmic map um, is computed as follows. You just take the uh, relative uh, distance in the ambient space, um, then you project that back. You project that to the tangent plane and renormalize uh, to the same length. And for parallel transport, uh, we uh, to map a, um, a vector from the tangent plane at V to the tangent plane at Q. Uh, we basically just rotate the vector um, along axis A and with angle theta. That we uh, uh, talked about earlier, and then we re and then after that rotation, this vector will be tangential to the tangent plane at Q. So we can just reinterpret it as a vector on Q, and we say that this is the parallel transport. So this is so m m yeah, uh, this is an um, an approximation that um, makes it very easy to work with and gives us all the symmetry properties that we wanted. Um, but it's maybe. Um, um, we do lose a potentially important information, um, but um, uh, this did work well for us in practice. <laughs> um, if we do this, all these operations on the sphere, then it's actually exact. So in a, in a similar work, uh, I work with uh, Berke Kitsch and Naglu um, on uh, applying these methods on an exact sphere. So if you'd have some information on like the Earth, um, then um, you um, uh, can process information about this that, and you will be equivariant with respect to uh, the isometries of the mesh, which would uh, here be uh, arbitrary rotations of the, uh, of the sphere, modulo discretization issues. Um, yes. So now let's talk about the nonlinearities, because we talked about how to do the linear convolutions. But we also need nonlinearities to make uh, uh, neural networks. So what we want is um, for any um, uh, d-dimensional uh, representation of a group uh, uh, G, uh, we want to find a, a nonlinear map that maps from D to D such that is equivariant or 
meaning that uh, if we apply the nonlinearity and then the uh, group action, that it is the same as applying the group action and then the nonlinearity. Um, one obvious choice for any uh, by linearity of linear representations is to do scalar multiplication. And this is actually uh, done a lot, and uh, you can uh, uh, implement that in different ways. So one way of doing that is we define any nonlinearity, like a ReLU with a bias or, uh, or 10 eights or whatever you like. And then we apply something called the, and you, then you could construct something called the norm nonlinearity. So you take a vector V, you compute its norm, you feed the norm, which is now a scalar, uh, through the nonlinearity. You could divide by the norm if you wish. Um, and then uh, use this as a scalar multiplication. And by linearity, uh, this is um, uh, because the norm is an invariant feature. Uh, here I'm assuming our representation is orthogonal, so the norm is invariant. Um, this is an equivariant transformation. Another uh, thing you could do is the so squash nonlinearity. Um, you uh, would uh, take the norm and divide it by the norm plus one. Or a gated nonlinearity. If we have our neural network output not only our vector, but also a scalar, then we could just apply our nonlinearity to the scalar and um, scalar multiply uh, that with our vector v. So these are all used in practice. And if you're interested in comparisons of performance between them, I think Maurice's and Gabriele's paper on uh, planar CNNs does a, a large scale comparison of these kinds of different nonlinearities. Yeah. In general, any Yes. Um, in particular, if uh, the um, um, if the representation is a, a permutation, um, so then a, the group acting on v would just mean to permute the indices of uh, of, a of the vector v. Then it's very easy to see that any pointwise operation like a ReLU applied to the components of V element wise will be equivariant because if you have a vector and uh, you apply nonlinearity element wise, then you permute them. That's the same as first permuting and then applying the nonlinearity. So this works for discrete groups. And I guess it's the obvious choice for discrete groups if your representations are permutations. But uh, infinite groups, of course, uh, don't really have um, uh, permutation representation, finitely dimensional permutation representations. So what do we do? Yeah. Um, if you if you wish, you could do that. Um, but the way I often think of, like if you think of a multi-layer perceptron, what you normally do is you would uh, change dimensions with your linear layers and uh, your um, nonlinearity would kind of preserve the dimensionality of your space. But if you want, you can look at uh, other kinds of things. But such things can, of course, always be constructed as first a linear and then a nonlinear. But yeah, th this is to keep the design space a little smaller uh, for the <laughs> for the presentation. In this way, you are preserving not only the dimension, but also the, the type of the tensor. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you could definitely change that um, if you wish. Uh, and make something more general. Yeah. Um, so how do we do that for infinite groups? Uh, well, we do it by sampling. So continuous uh, signals on the circle, uh, they are just um, 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 functions from the circle. They are here called S1 to the uh, real line. Um, and these are so-called regular representations of the group SO2 because in a way um, the group acts by permutation on them. So if we think of V being like an infinite dimensional vector and we act with um, the group element G on it, uh, we basically permute the position or the index of our infinite dimensional vector. So we can think of um, our uh, these uh, signals on this circle as actually uh, infinite dimensional vectors on which SO2 rep, uh, acts by permutation, roughly speaking. So then what we could do is we could um, think of features as uh, uh, signals on the circle and apply a, a pointwise uh, nonlinearity to construct something equivariant. But we would need infinite, uh, we would need to fully represent the signal on the sphere, on the circle, so that would not be uh, practical. We need infinite memory, so we need to somehow make this finite. 
to do so, um, we can uh, look at the band limited Fourier or actually inverse Fourier transform. And what it does, it, it, it maps certain irre irreducible representations, like finite be many, uh, to a signal in the sphere. You can see this exactly as a normal, as you're used to it, a normal band limited Fourier transform that gives that uh, maps a, a factor of uh, features to um, uh, uh, two signals on the circle. Um, if we would then finitely sample this circle on a uniform gridding on the circle, uh, we can see this as a linear transformation from these irreducible representations uh, to a set of n samples on the circle. And then we're going to do so. Then our uh, procedure would be we uh, take our uh, features, um, we um, map them to, the, to uh, n samples on the circle, we apply a pointwise nonlinearity. And then do the inverse by taking a band limited Fourier transform back to irreducible representations. Um, and uh, we show that uh, this is not exactly equivariant. Yes. So uh, you start off with the first set of the rest, right? Yeah. But when you map back, you say it's not different. Yeah, you could do something else if you want. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when you have a high frequency starting grid, yeah. and you apply real there, you might have higher frequency sequence signal. Mm -hmm. But then you would have to come back to uh, yeah, more error fields. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you ditch the higher, the higher order representations. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Because other, otherwise, I think a ReLU would give you all the frequencies that you need. Yeah. But so, yeah, it's a band limiting uh, uh, transformation, yeah. Yes, by this argument. Uh, <laughs> namely, this induces an equivariance, which if like our nonlinearity is Lipschitz, um, you uh, get an error that if uh, n goes, if you take infinitely many samples, sorry, this big n is equal to that small n, uh, then you are exact. Um, but you, of course, the higher frequencies bandwidth you allow, uh, the more samples you need. And uh, in the appendix of our paper, you can see our uh, arguments for that. Any questions at this stage about nonlinearities or something else? Oh, skip that. No, not that. Oh, it's going on on this. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, linear layers. We talked about nonlinear layers, but we also need to feed something into the neural network to start with. Um, so what you could do, and what we actually did in our uh, when we wrote the paper, is to use the XYZ coordinates of um, of each point. And this is gates invariant. You can see this as a scalar field on the mesh, um, but it's not coordinate free, of course. Uh, the coordinates are in there. So it, it's um, even though our convolutional method is uh, ignorant about how our mesh is embedded, if we start out with the coordinates. Uh, in the network, then of course the output is also going to depend from the coordinates. So we can never achieve like uh, coordinate freeness this way. So um, for the medical project, uh, we set out to study what kind of input features make sense uh, that are like fully equivariant. What are the simplest features that we can construct? Uh, we thought that are uh, nicely equivariant. So first we start with the um, um, inside that. Uh, an ambient um, feature, so like an ambient, um, for example, an ambient vector, a three vector, can be represented as a tangent vector and a real number that says something about how far does it point off the, um, uh, the plane. So we can see that an ambient vector um, can be mapped projectively um, or like isomorphically uh, in the category of linear spaces to an element of the tangent like linearly, linearly, bijectively, to um, uh, a, a, tangent a tangent feature and a, a scalar. And you can also take the square of that. So if we would have a, a tensor product of two such vectors at a point P, then we can um, reinterpret that as features on the surface. And what we get is we get a, the, a square of a vector. Um, uh, we get a square of a vector on the manifold. 
uh, we get two vectors on the manifold and we get one real number, which is the distributivity of, of this. Um, so uh, we can represent a, a three by three matrix um, at the point uh, as features on the mesh. And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to construct three matrices. These are just something we came up with that seemed easy to, uh, to work with. And these are going to encode something about the local geometry uh, at each point. So one of the things we can do is we can look at the normal uh, factors, uh, take the outer product of them, average that over all the neighbors. So we are interested. We construct a matrix at a point P. We look at all neighbors Q, and we take the outer product of the uh, normal directions and um, uh, the uh, normal vectors at the points P and Q, and then we average that. Similarly, we can look at um, uh, add a, from a point P. We look at all neighbors Q, and this we look at the um, vector pointing from P to Q. We take the outer product of that with itself and average that over neighbors. And uh, similarly, we can contract the outer product, the relative uh, distance with the normal factors. So these are just a couple of simple matrices we could construct. And I'm open to suggestions about other things we could construct. Uh, and then we just uh, represent these as initial features uh, by, by this uh, isomorphism. So what gives us that? It gives us three times uh, features, namely um, uh, in in irreducible representations, gives us three times three scalar features, three times two vector features, and three features of order two. And we take these as input to our network. Uh, yes. Um, so I think that the trace of this one is related to a quantity like a scalar curvature quantity that people use in differential geometry i don't know about the, all the other stuff uh, yeah that's a great point i um these were the simplest i could construct <laughs> um if someone has a nice interpretation for them then i'm very happy to uh, to hear about this And similarly, uh, to uh, build a network, and especially if you want to do uh, like deeper networks, you want to generally do pooling in your mesh. And pooling, uh, we do a very simple procedure. So we find like a pooling grid in terms of the ambient space. So we just find, uh, given a, core, a fine level grid, we uh, pick a coarse level set of mesh, uh, a coarse level set of vertices that are like as far apart as possible uh, uh, with a certain ratio uh, of vertices from the fine to the coarse grid. And then uh, to do pooling uh, from the fine to the coarse, uh, we just parallel transport uh, to the, from the fine to the coarse, um, average, and um, that's our pooling. To unpool, uh, we take the feature at a coarse level, we, cop we parallel transport that to all the fine level nodes, um, and that's our unpooling. Now we have 15 minutes, yeah, great. So um, that, now let's look a little bit at an application to uh, to blood flow. And I must give all the credits here to Julian Souk, who did all the work for this project. Um, so in, in humans, the shape of the arteries, which bring our blood through, <laughs> through our body, is related to certain medical risks, such as aneurysms, in which the arteries uh, burst. Um, and uh, I, I believe a, a healthy shaped artery would have an inside shape that looks like this, and an unhealthy one would look like this. And um, uh, it may be important to um, um, to know how the blood flows through arteries of particular shapes. Um, and in particular, what people are interested in is, um, as I said, the blood flows through the arteries and exerts a shear stress. So a shear is like something moves along each other and then exerts a pressure in the direction of flow um, on the um, um, on the on the wall of the artery and um, what you would like to uh, have is a non-invasive so without operating on um, uh, without operating figure out uh, what the wall shear stress is so what you would do is you could take an MRI scanner and um, a gif and uh, through complicated processing steps give you a mesh of the artery. Um, 
then what, what you could do and what people do is um, use an expensive computational fluid dynamics simulation uh, to figure out how the blood would flow through an artery of that shape. Um, but this may take a prohibitively uh, a long amount of time, especially if you'd like um, in, in a medical setting, it may be uh, relevant for a doctor to get quick results. So the idea is here to learn a neural network, to, uh, which is then called a surrogate, to predict the wall shear stress um, and the computational fluid dynamics, then it's used as the ground truth to train the model. So we have an expensive uh, model and we train a fast model to approximate the expensive model. So at inference time, we can just run the quick surrogate model. And the data set that um, Julian trains this on is a, a set of uh, realistically looking random meshes of human arteries. And here, uh, arteries uh, are um, um, not necessarily in a canonical orientation. They can have all kinds of complicated branching, so there's no canonical way to put them up straight. Uh, so you would want to be equivariant with their foes in your uh, data. So you want to use some equivariant method. Um, the network architecture uh, that, that, that was used is called a UNet. And uh, a UNet uh, works as follows. So you start with your input features, which are, um, are uh, the matrix features I illustrated, and also information about um, how um, far we are from the inflow point. Um, then we do some convolutions and some nonlinearities to get features at the fine uh, level. Then we do a pooling step, apply our network in the uh, coarser level, do another pooling step, apply our network on the coarsest level, and then unpool and unpool, uh, where we also copy information from the fine level here to the fine level here. And this is called the UNet with skip connections, and it's used a lot in these kind of uh, 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 setups. Um, now, one um, uh, additional thing that uh, is interesting is uh, the way the blood, uh, the, the, the shear stress exerted by the blood is uh, dependent on the inflow of the blood, uh, which is very dependent on where we are in the cardiac cycle. So if your heart is pumping or is resting, it uh, depends on how the blood works, uh, how the, <laughs> on the shear, uh, affects the shear stress. So uh, what they do is we look at a discrete set of time points and just predict the shear stress at all uh, time points at each vertex. So uh, on steady flow, so without the time component, uh, here are some qualitative results. So what you can see here is the, the mesh. Um, the ground truth would predict there is like higher shear um, on, um, on the stenosis, which is the point where the artery is uh, less wide. Um, and uh, we predict vectors of shear stress. So here it is as a vector. And you see that our, predict our prediction uh, at least qualitatively matches the points of high pressure on the on the mesh. And we looked at uh, meshes that are single arteries or have some branching in them. We also have um, qualitative results and um, we, have, we are bold, of course. And um, so uh, this is an expression of the um, the uh, normalized mean absolute error is an expression of how, how uh, much you deviate from the ground truth. And uh, we compare to a couple of methods like uh, um, a CNN that is unaware of directions, like state CNN, or a feast CNN that is parameterized by the local coordinates. Uh, and point net plus plus is also uh, aware of, of, uh, of the coordinates. And we see that on single arteries, we perform very uh, similar um, as point net and better than the other methods. But now we are also here in generation, we can, if you want, uh, put all the meshes kind of in the same direction. Um, but now if you were to, uh, at test time, randomly rotate our meshes as we may encounter them in the wild, then we see um, that uh, here in the top line, the point net methods dropped dramatically in performance because it was only trained on meshes in some orientation. Now we, we evaluated the meshes in another orientation and we see that it completely collapses. What people would often suggest is a solution to equivariance is to augment your data. Um, so instead of your training set uh, containing all just uh, meshes in one pose, you randomly uh, transform the pose and then train your network with that. And that's what we would do here. So uh, here, this point net variant in the second row uh, would have a data that at training time was randomly uh, rotated. But still, we see that the performance has dropped compared to the first one. 
because um, data augmentation is not by itself equivalent to having an equivariant network. An equivariant network in a way is doing data augmentation at each input and each output of every layer, which is a much richer set of constraints than uh, just um, uh, looking at, um, uh, than just doing data augmentation, even if you could um, uh, do, uh, would do data augmentation infinitely much. Additionally, um, data augmentation only trains you to be equivariant on the data that you've seen and not on the data that you've not seen, even the, while an equivariant method is equivariant everywhere by design. And also on the uh, uh, bifurcating arteries, which have a branching in them, we see similar results. But to end, there's a, oh, yeah, that's a question. Um, I think we had a couple thousand arteries, each consisting of a couple thousand points. That order of magnitude. Uh, I, yeah, I could look up in the paper if you, if you want more specific uh, numbers. So um, here we see um, the uh, predictions over time. So what the network predicted is uh, the shear stress at each point in time, and then you can make an animation out of that. So in the uh, ground truth, you see um, some sort of a cyclic behavior going on. And in the prediction, you see um, something that qualitatively looks somewhat similar. Yes? Uh, so that, that's, so the, the heart is pumping, and, and you can model that as a, an inflow in your computation fluid dynamics uh, that is varying in time. And uh, that's what we train on. No, what we just do is for each vertex, we uh, output for all like a finite set of times that we're interested in. Uh, so we just do like p times an output for each vertex in the network, and then we make the network a little bit wider to to accommodate. And there's other things you could do, but the, this was this was easy for us. Well, so one answer you could give is milliseconds, and that would be the time of inference. So if you would give a network to, uh, if you would give a model to our network, and uh, you would just ask what would the prediction be on this particular mesh, it would be milliseconds. The cheating here is, of course, that there's a training phase that 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 that, that went before that, um, and, and that that could take hours to days. Um, but then, of course, if you deploy to the wild, you don't train anymore, but you just do inference. So in the ideal setting where you have a trained model, you give it to a doctor, it would be milliseconds. And that could, I've been told by my collaborators, be interesting for a doctor. Uh, imagine maybe they um, um, they are doing some maybe invasive procedure where they're operating, and they, then they can make a better estimate of what the artery looks like then they could in real time do predictions on what the shape, what the consequence of the shape is for the for the blood flow and make decisions based on that. That's what I've been told is why uh, uh, low latency may be uh, clinically interesting. Uh, no, no uh, I mean, so one um, milliseconds per mesh. So, uh, Yes, yeah, 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 but uh, yeah, I've parallelized that to some cluster and then, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's the same. All right, so uh, gate equivariant CNN is a simple and scalable method because we made all these approximations. It's anisotropic, so it's more expressive than uh, other methods that may be uh, 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 isotropic, and it has uh, desirable symmetry properties. Um, and you can try it out at this link, where there hopefully is a nice um, library for you to use. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions.
Well, so well, 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 for, well, we have. I mean, we have a con we have one parameterization, right? So we pick a kernel, and uh, for each uh, point on the tangent plane, we just get a one matrix, and we we use that for all points for all meshes. So we have a canonical parameterization that at least gives us some answer on any mesh. Um, another question is why would it be if you train it on one set of meshes generalized to another set of meshes? Is that your question? Yeah, I, I, I guess what you would want is your training data set to sufficiently cover the cases that you're interested in. Um, in the, the uh, draft paper that we're looking at, we're looking at some extrapolation properties where uh, you, for example, have like faster inflow than the training data set. And then Julian looks at how the error increases if you are slightly outside of your uh, training regime. Um, but I guess in the ideal sense, you would, especially if you have random, like if you succeed in having a random model of arteries that includes real arteries, uh, then you could just generate more data. Um, but yeah, in, in, in practice, extrapolation is very important. Um, I don't really have a clear story for that. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, then you are kind of going into the direction of like solving partial differential equations with neural networks. And that's a very interesting uh, line of research. Here we're kind of not really doing the simulation itself, or like the we're not looking at the full space state space. We're just kind of looking at a set of outcomes. So that makes it an easier problem. But we are uh, exploring, uh, looking into that. You would need probably need some uh, voluminous uh, model. So maybe some point cloud like model to model the flow. Um, that is something like a direction that's very much be interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thinking about the example you said where they've adopted one out of change, which is yeah. if you have a free trade network, then you could run a differentiated spectral and try and change the mesh with the voltage. But is that something that is feasible? Uh, yeah, that is feasible, as in like uh, the pre computation phase in the spherical approximation. Which I think is also called oriented tangent, uh, oriented point clouds. I've been told by Michael, um, and uh, um, th that's very fast. Um, whether you will, whether kind of backpropagation through this gives you like nice gradients that give you nice learning signals. That's that's a separate question that I haven't studied. So all we need is point clouds with normal vectors. So if so, then we can directly apply this method. So if you can somehow, by looking at the structure of the molecule, infer something about a normal vector, you can just directly apply this. If you want to be fully 3D equivariant, then you kind of go from this kind of surface story to a volume story. And uh, there's a lot of works on like SO3 equivariant point cloud methods. Uh, and I think that's the regime you're in then. Um, and I'll say a little bit about those uh, this evening. question about molecules, so we actually use different proteins uh, that are represented as molecular surfaces, and uh, it works very nicely, so we don't do anything in terms of the mesh matrices. But you're still on a surface level then? So we're using a surface, so the surface is generated from the variety of things, and we use both. Like 
Interesting. It works extremely well. It was also implemented with the kernel patients So in in that particular application, it allows to Oh. Wow. Yeah, I, I'd be curious in that because with all these equivariant transformations, I feel that there's a huge potential for like custom kernels to do it fast because you have these matrix multiplications that are often sparse. And these step scored and coefficients are like a sparse matrix. I would like to learn more at some point. Thanks. Any more questions? Then I think we should go uh, to lunch. Thank you very much.